As an anti-Stratfordian and as an unorthodox biographer, I am convinced that there is a Shakespeare authorship question. And this weekend, the world marks the 400th anniversary of William Shakespeare's death in Stratford. Today, I'm going to raise questions about just why we are marking this occasion, how do we know that we are marking the occasion of the world's greatest dramatist, and I'll be talking a little bit about why I changed my mind and I'm going to introduce a few issues that influenced my decision. My main focus has been on Shakespeare's professional career. His principal occupation, so we are told, was writing. He was also professionally active as a theatrical shareholder, as an actor, and in some other lines of work. But I don't think that any biographer would argue that for Shakespeare, writing plays was just a sideline. And yet I have been unable to find any evidence that Shakespeare's primary vocation, or even one of his sidelines, was writing. How many of us should trust a biography supposedly about the world's greatest aviator if there's no evidence that the supposed pilot had ever flown a plane? How many of us should trust a biography supposedly about the world's greatest dramatist if there's no evidence that he ever composed a line of dialogue? Now, most biographies, and Chris touched on this, they're filled with information about Stratford and London and England and theatrical practices, and they go on to speculate what Shakespeare must have done, might have done, could have done. But biographers can be sure of Shakespeare's business dealings. Sometimes they're sure of his whereabouts. They're sure of some of his theatrical activities, but they are forced to resort to speculation when it comes to his literary development and activities. And that includes James Shapiro's recent microbiography, The Year of Lear, just out. One of the biggest temptations is to speculate on what Shakespeare was doing before making his debut as a published writer. He was born in April 1564, and the first Shakespeare poem was published in 1593, when he was 29 years old. Now, since there's no evidence to tell us about his education and training during those formative years, the period is usually dubbed the lost years, and most biographers devote a full chapter to them. And these years are important. They must equip Shakespeare for a literary debut that otherwise has him springing like the goddess Athena fully armed from the head of Zeus. Well, that's not a very credible scenario, so biographers speculate. Excuse me, Dan. Do we have it? Yep. Is this better? Some suppose that he spent the lost years in a law office, which would account for the poet's creative use of legalese. And the plays demonstrate an intimate familiarity with the lifestyle and the pastimes of the aristocrat. So perhaps he was busy cultivating aristocratic patrons. The earliest plays reveal fluency in at least five languages and first-hand knowledge of parts of Italy and France, so some speculate that he took the Continental Grand Tour to Italy and France. And if any of you have read uh, Richard Rowe's uh, travel guide, Shakespeare's travel guide to Italy, you will know just how persuasive and convincing that evidence is. And it's all been in the text, hiding in plain sight for 400 years. Well, others have made a case for Shakespeare's interim career as a country schoolmaster, and still others have argued that Shakespeare spent those lost years as an acting apprentice, a shareholder, a soldier, a sailor, a medical student, a printer, a gardener, a bookworm, a spy, a secretary, or a tutor in some noble household. Well, the lost years are not infinitely elastic, and yet these various conjectural assignments, when you lay them end to end, stretch decades beyond the years available. But each conjecture is supported with convincing evidence of the playwright's familiarity with this vocation or that activity. So you could hypothesize that he spent the lost years as a law clerk, but if he did, then he couldn't have been the continental traveler or the country schoolmaster. So each hypothetical assignment is leaving him deficient in other critical areas. Well, if he actually did accomplish all this, he had to have been something of a whirling dervish. The problem is that nobody has been able to trace this whirling dervish's progress through any educational institution, any upper-class household, or any foreign country. 
So Shakespeare makes his literary debut at age 29 with no visible means of educational or cultural support. Now, I'm not arguing that he couldn't have done it. Theoretically, of course, he could have. My question is, how did he do it without leaving any tracks? How did he obtain an education? Where are his letters, his papers, his manuscripts? Where is the record of his success gaining a patron or interacting with intellectuals? We know the dramatist, whoever he was, read hundreds and hundreds of books. There were no libraries back then, no public libraries. So where is the record showing how Shakespeare gained access to books? Where are his own books? Now, not only are the lost years devoid of any evidence of this sort, the rest of his life yields no such evidence either. How can this be? So I want to focus on this deficiency in Shakespeare's documented record. The genre of literary biography is supposed to be constructed around manuscripts, letters, diaries, payments for writing, and so on. These are the records that allow biographers to reconstruct the professional progress of their subject. Auditors look for financial paper trails. I went looking for Shakespeare's literary paper trails. And much of my research involved examining and testing evidence to see if it supported Shakespeare's literary biography. We're not speaking here of a medical biography, the life of a doctor, or a political biography, or a legal biography, but a literary biography, the life of a writer. And a personal literary paper trail is the term I use to describe evidence that supports one simple statement. He was a writer. That doesn't sound like it should be a tall order. Evidence of a professional career can take many forms. Think of your own lines of work. What records prove what you do or used to do for a living? A record of your birth won't do it. Neither will your driver's license. But your employer's payroll register will. Most of you probably have some professional paraphernalia lying around the house, whether it's reference books, professional journals, a union rule book, an employment contract. You have probably written letters, Christmas holiday newsletters, sent emails, any kind of messages where you've made reference to your job. And your future biographer will try to track all those down. Biographers weigh and test and analyze evidence, and as I approached that critical phase of my research, I simply adopted the criteria for testing evidence that not only makes the most common sense, it's the criteria routinely applied by other biographers and historians. An example, reading what somebody thought of a play 50 years after the author died may be very interesting to a literary critic, but it isn't going to be very useful to the biographer. Neither are anecdotes retailed by people who never actually knew the person. Posthumous legend and hearsay may be based on a grain of truth, but most biographers do not place the same value on them as they do contemporaneous testimony. So in weighing the evidence for Shakespeare, I place a higher value on records created during his lifetime, not those set down sometime after he died. And those of you who watch reruns of Law and Order or Perry Mason or other crime and detective shows might think about those cases that are sheer guesswork until the detectives find enough good evidence on which to prosecute the case. The attorneys are not supposed to go into the courtroom armed only with secondhand hearsay and circumstantial evidence. They need facts and firsthand testimony that will hold up under cross-examination. Think for a moment about book reviews. Book reviews are usually written by people who never met the author and would not recognize the author if they ran into them on the sidewalk. In other words, literary criticism is not necessarily useful in establishing an author's network of relationships or shedding light on his personality or telling us about his personal life. And back then, when people wrote about Shakespeare's plays and poems, they wrote book reviews, they quoted Shakespearean lines, they named Shakespeare plays and poems and characters, but nobody wrote about Shakespeare the writer as though they actually knew him. 
And yet traditional Orthodox biographers weave into their narrative of Shakespeare's life all those book reviews and literary commentary as though they constituted personal evidence and testimony for him as an author. And there are thousands of Orthodox biographies that advance this narrative. I am challenging the narrative. Now, both sides are looking at the same evidence, so how is it that we come to such radically different conclusions? The answer for me is very simple. We don't frame our questions in the same way. Orthodox biographers make no attempt to gather up and retest all the documentary evidence to determine what it was that Shakespeare did for a living. They have no need. They already know. Like most people, they accept Shakespeare's authorship pretty much as an article of faith. And if anyone assumes that he was the author, then it logically follows that you could try to weave into the biographical narrative all those book reviews, all the literary allusions, and in particular, the title pages. But if you are asking what is it that Shakespeare did for a living, you're going to wait until you identify evidence of his professional literary activities before considering the book reviews and the title pages. So when I started looking into the evidence for Shakespeare's life, I fully expected, probably like everybody here, I thought I'd find personal testimony from his literary friends, manuscripts in his handwriting, notebooks filled with scribblings in iambic pentameter, letters mentioning writing projects, records of how much he was paid to write. There's no evidence for Shakespeare of those sorts. And that brings me to another critical question that I asked myself during the research. Is it reasonable to expect such professional evidence to have survived for Shakespeare or anybody else? We're speaking here of a man, as we all know, who lived 400 years ago. Between then and now, uh, there was the Great Fire of London. The Globe Theater itself burned down. Who knows what records just went up in smoke or decayed over time? Maybe it's unusual to find that kind of professional documentation for anybody who lived that long ago. Well, I didn't know the answer, so that's why I decided to track down the evidence for two dozen other writers from the time period so I could compare their professional records, if there were any, to Shakespeare's. I just wanted to know if Shakespeare was the odd man out. The results of that analysis? Yes, he is the odd man out. He is the only alleged writer of any consequence from the time period for whom one must rely on posthumous evidence to support that one simple statement, he was a writer. And that comparative analysis is, in my view, the single strongest argument against the orthodox biography and the traditional attribution. We don't have authorship questions about Shakespeare's famous or not so famous contemporaries, as Chris mentioned. Nobody doubts that Ben Jonson wrote plays such as Volpone or Edmund Spencer wrote poetry such as The Fairy Queen. But we can be confident that Johnson and Spencer and the rest of them were writers because we have evidence of their professional literary careers, the evidence that I call personal literary paper trails. You can look at a few of Johnson's manuscripts in the British Museum. We know how much Thomas Nash was rewarded by a patron for writing a pa pamphlet. Samuel Daniel defended a play that he wrote that had offended a courtier. George Peel made a bid for literary patronage from Lord Burley. And the poets Michael Drayton and William Drummond exchanged views on poetry. We know all these things because original letters survive, some account books survive, books survive, and some of those books are inscribed or contain marginalia. Even a few manuscripts survive. And I should mention that once I had looked into two dozen records uh, for two dozen writers, by the time I got to writer number 10, I was down into the third string. Nobody today has heard of Thomas Nash or George Peel. Thomas Decker is virtually unknown today except to students of English drama, but I found records that he was paid to write plays, so I can support that statement for Thomas Decker. He was a professional playwright. I can't support that statement for Shakespeare. Nevertheless, you're going to read that Shakespeare was paid to write. There's no records of payment. There's, and despite what you may have read a couple of weeks ago about the Sir Thomas More manuscript, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, he did not leave behind any manuscripts, and he didn't leave behind any letters. 
He undoubtedly owned books, but nobody's ever found one. And this is what is unique about Shakespeare's literary biography and why I keep hammering on it. He is the only alleged writer from the time period for whom you must rely on posthumous evidence to support that one statement he was a writer. In short, Shakespeare's literary biography is circumstantial. And if writing the plays were a crime, Shakespeare could not be convicted on the evidence. Scholars don't identify this most glaring of deficiencies in the biography, and that's the complete absence of personal literary paper trails. Those who express dismay at the paucity of evidence are implying that there is some legitimate peg on which to hang Shakespeare's bio biographical skeleton, but there is no such literary peg. And quite recently, one prominent Orthodox scholar, Stanley Wells again of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and the one who's meeting up with Don Rubin this weekend, he finally agreed with me and on his blog. He agreed that the first evidence identifying Shakespeare of Stratford as a writer was posthumous. Alarm bells go off. That might have signaled some progress, but Wells went on to state in his blog that he considered that fact irrelevant. I guess he still does. Well, I want to explain some of the ways in which traditional Shakespeare biographers try to compensate for this deficiency of evidence. One technique is to present Shakespeare's theatrical documentation as though it were evidence of his literary activities. For example, Shakespeare's name appears prominently in a number of theatrical documents, and we are sometimes told that he's listed prominently because he was the company's leading playwright. But evidence of being a shareholder, even a prominent shareholder in a theater or acting company is not evidence of being a writer. Another favorite technique is to present impersonal literary commentary as though it were personal testimony about the author himself. Now, the Shakespeare of the Orthodox biography is a very likable and a self-effacing fellow. And among the recurring adjectives used routinely by biographers to describe the bard are gentle and sweet, as in Sweet Swan of Avon. But the adjective sweet describes the written verse not whoever wrote them. And playwright Ben Johnson coined the ambiguous epithet gentle Shakespeare seven years after Shakespeare had died. Nobody in Shakespeare's lifetime ever described him as having a gentle nature. This misappropriation of the words gentle and sweet to reconstruct a personality profile for Shakespeare goes back a long way. The very first attempt at a thumbnail biographical sketch of Shakespeare was by Nicholas Rowe, in his preface to his 1709 edition of the Shakespeare plays. And he described Shakespeare's sweetness in his manners and good-natured disposition. But Nicholas Rowe made no attempt to verify anything in his account, and most of it is based on secondhand sources. And yet most subsequent biographers simply have followed suit. The late Samuel Schoenbaum, whose documentary biography of Shakespeare remains highly respected today, concluded that almost everyone seems to have thought well of Shakespeare, and he supported that statement by quoting literary comments, not personal descriptions. And recently, good old Stanley Wells published a booklet on Kindle in which he said pretty much the same thing. So this myth of a gentle and a sweet-natured Shakespeare is just that. It's a myth. But it is not a harmless myth because it spawns a bigger myth. Biographers report that such allusions tell us not only about Shakespeare's supposed personality, but also by extension about his presumed circle of friends, especially his literary colleagues who recognized him as this sweet-natured individual. That is how biographers transmute impersonal literary criticism into first-hand testimony about Shakespeare, the writer. And there's more. To construct a sweet-natured Shakespeare, biographers are obliged to gloss over or sometimes completely ignore any number of not-so-sweet records that prove that Shakespeare hoarded grain during a famine, was named in a warrant for his arrest following an altercation, was a hard-headed real estate investor who do, drove a hard bargain, was accused of being a skinflint, defaulted on his taxes, and pursued petty lawsuits. Now, none of these really make him a bad guy, but they are at odds with the sweet-natured and gentle character study. 
Surely there is professional evidence for Shakespeare. He left over 70 documents in his wake. And yes, there is a lot of professional evidence for Shakespeare. But all of it relates to other lines of work, non-literary work. The Shakespeare that I find in the historical record was one of the upwardly mobile commercial class. He was a shrewd theatrical and real estate investor, an entrepreneur, and a businessman, a commodity trader, a money lender. And I make the case in my book that he was his theatrical company's financier and business agent. The Shakespeare in traditional biography comes across to me as a paradox, an unbelievable conflation of two distinct individuals welded together to form an incoherent individual, one whom I describe in my book as gentle yet belligerent, famous yet unknown, educated yet unschooled, here yet there. <laughs> yeah, he turns up in two places at the same time when you actually spreadsheet it all. Anyway, these conflicting characteristics are inevitable when one splices together the literary output of one individual under the documentary records of somebody else. Was Shakespeare even capable of writing the plays and poems? He is a man of no recorded education. And the trail of evidence that he did leave behind does not suggest that he was capable of writing Hamlet or King Lear. Well, one favorite response to that objection is to cite Shakespeare's genius to explain away any educational or cultural gaps. You will read that the ways of genius are mysterious and inexplicable. Well, the ways of genius may be inexplicable to us mere mortals, but the progress and development of a genius should not be completely untraceable. You can find fragments of literary paper trails for geniuses who lived before the age of Shakespeare, including Dante and Ariosto. So to sum up the thesis, if he was the writer he is supposed to have been, if he is the author proclaimed on the title page, then we should have no difficulty finding some professional evidence to support that one simple statement he was a writer. But the documentation that does exist proves that Shakespeare was active in other professions, the theatrical shareholder, the businessman, the real estate investor, for around 25 years, from his late 20s till he was nearly 50. And that brings me to another question that I always hear. About half the Shakespeare plays were published during his lifetime. Some were published anonymously, but others had the name Shakespeare right there on the title page. How do I explain that? In fact, how could anyone propose with a straight face that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare when William Shakespeare of Stratford is known to have been a member of the very acting companies that performed these plays? Well, first of all, all those title page attributions constitute excellent circumstantial evidence for the man from Stratford but they do not necessarily constitute reliable evidence of authorship. Shakespeare did not write The London Prodigal, but it was published during his lifetime with his name on the title page. There are numerous examples of incomplete or misattributions with other Shakespeare plays and poems, among them Pericles, Lover's Complaint, Passionate Pilgrim, and Henry VIII. And secondly, if Shakespeare was not the writer we all thought he was, then it is possible that his name is on those title pages for some other reason. You don't have to look very far to find other title page misattributions in Elizabethan and Jacobean literature. And those misattributions were made for a wide variety of reasons. But in Shakespeare's case, the explanation may be found in the customs of the time, in the social caste system that di dictated one set of rules for the commoner and another for the upper classes. Most anti-Stratfordians, myself among them, hypothesized that the person who wrote the works of Shakespeare was a gentleman of the upper class. And in Elizabethan England, a gentleman of rank did not publish plays or poetry under his own name, lest he be suspected of having a commercial profession. He circulated his verses and manuscripts privately amongst his friends, sort of as literary trinkets, or in a time-honored method of communication in a uh, still largely manuscript culture. But to write as a professional for financial gain was unthinkable. This restraint has been called the stigma of print. And essentially, the stigma of print discouraged the publication of works that could be seen either as frivolous, such as poetry, or as driven by an unseemly interest in profit, such as creative fiction 
or commercial plays, written for the buying public, or even worse, performed on the public stage. Any gentleman of rank who was good enough to write professionally could not be seen to be doing so. So pseudonyms were just one of many devices employed to avoid the stigma of print. And you'll find poems back then subscribed with the name Ignoto, which was the Elizabethan equivalent of anonymous. Some printers shuffled attributions or used initials. There were cryptic mottos. Some just left the, uh, any attribution off. So let's suppose you're a gentleman of rank. You are a compulsive artist. You must write. Maybe you want to see your plays performed on stage. Or maybe you need money. But for whatever reason, you decide to sell your manuscript as long as you don't tarnish the family reputation by being caught in the transaction. One option is to sell your manuscript to an agent or a broker named William Shakespeare on condition of anonymity. Perhaps you negotiate with your broker to get him to publish your work under his name. Or maybe Shakespeare the play broker unilaterally decides to take authorship credit because he knows that a gentleman author cannot raise an objection without exposing himself as the author. Or let's consider another hypothesis. Perhaps Shakespeare, the broker, hires a stenographer to record a live performance on stage, and he, then he sells that report to the printer. In all of these cases, Shakespeare, the play broker, is in a position to take authorship credit if he wants to. Such arrangements are described in Elizabethan literature. A romance novelist and pamphleteer named Robert Greene, same one from Grotesworth of Wit, described this type of authorship fraud, and in one of his prefaces we learned that, and I'm going to quote, if they come to write or publish anything in print, which for their calling and gravity, being loath to have any profane pamphlets pass under their hand, get some other Batillus to set his name to their verses. So gentlemen of rank and dignity don't want to disgrace themselves by publishing their poetry over their own names, so they got a Batillus to take authorship credit. Well, who's Batillus? Batillus was an ancient Roman who took authorship credit for the verses written by Virgil. In addition to Batillus, there is another historical prototype for this scenario, also dating back to ancient Rome. Some of you will have heard of Terence, a playwright who specialized in writing comedies. But Terence was also known for taking credit for plays written by aristocrats, and his reputation was well known to the Elizabethans. There is an epigram published in 1610 addressed to our English Terence, Mr. Will Shakespeare. So, was the intention to associate Shakespeare with Terence, the writer of comedies, or with Terence, the Roman who, who took credit for plays written by aristocrats? It's not the only ambiguous allusion to Shakespeare's or his works. Okay, let's consider now Shakespeare's modus operandi. If Shakespeare was a broker, trading in plays as commodities, and taking credit for those he obtained from one or more gentlemen, we might expect to find his name on title pages of works not only by Shakespeare, the dramatist, whoever he was, but also by other writers. And we do. We find the Shakespeare Apocrypha, those plays by other playwrights, such as the London Prodigal, published with the name William Shakespeare on the title page, or like Locrine, published over the initials WS. We find the Passionate Pilgrim, a collection of poems, mostly by other poets, published in three editions over the name of Shakespeare. In recent years, I have found reason to expand the scenario to include the brokerage of plays by known professional playwrights, such as Thomas Middleton, who is today identified as the author of A Yorkshire Tragedy. That play was published during Shakespeare's lifetime and with his name on the title page. Well, if some professional writers resented the fact that Shakespeare did not write the works he took credit for, then might we not reasonably expect to find Shakespearean allusions to some sort of literary theft? We do. The first mention of him on the London theatrical scene was in 1592, when Shakespeare was lambasted as the upstart crow and accused of some sort of literary theft. The uh, epigram addressed to Shakespeare as our English Terence is just another example, one of many. There are many more questions, and I realize that today I will be leaving a lot of loose ends and unanswered questions. I actually don't pretend to have too many answers. My work is simply an attempt 
to legitimize the authorship question. And last month, with all the publicity about the British Library's uh, project to digitize their collection of English manuscripts, they, the headline of all those stories, and it was repeated worldwide, uh, had the Sir Thomas More editions, not supposedly in Shakespeare's hand, not possibly in Shakespeare's hand, not probably in Shakespeare's hand. This is the only surviving manuscript of his Shakespearean play in his handwriting. That is now set in stone with hundreds of reports in newspapers uh, and radio stations and so on worldwide. And I find that to be very too bad. It's made certainly all of our work a little bit harder now. And it's too bad because when it's freed from any preconception, I think that Shakespeare's documentary records produce a very viable narrative and one that is supported by the evidence. I find a coherent character. He wasn't gentle, he certainly wasn't sweet, and he didn't write any plays. But he had a fascinating and an important role in English theatrical history. He knew a marketable product when he saw it. He may not have written the Shakespeare plays, but he was probably the key agent of their transmission down to us today. And that strikes me as a very good reason to mark the 400th anniversary of his death. I don't like to leave without even an attempt at solving the problem. So I'm gonna borrow Damon Runyon's solution. Damon Runyon gave us the characters that ended up as Guys and Dolls, the musical, and he uh, reportedly sat through the world's worst performance of Hamlet. And when he came staggering out of it, he said, well, that performance will solve the authorship problem once and for all. Let's just open up the graves of Shakespeare, Oxford, and Bacon and see who rolled over. <laughs> Thank you.